Hi, I'm Bob McCoskery, National Director of Family First New Zealand. Dr. Miriam Grossman is a US psychiatrist specialising in adolescent and child psychiatry. She recently came to New Zealand to speak at the annual New Zealand Forum on the Family, and during that time she spoke to a group of Auckland principals and boards of trustees and teachers about the sex education curriculum and her concerns about it. Thank you for taking the time to watch her presentation. Now, here's Dr. Miriam Grossman. Thank you, Bob. When I graduated from medical school, I took an oath. I stood up, I raised my right hand, and I swore to prevent disease whenever I could. At that moment, I believed that the battles that lay ahead of me would be against cancer, heart disease, and emotional disorders. But after two decades and thousands of hours with young patients in distress, I've discovered that my most challenging fight is not against dangerous diseases, but against dangerous ideas. I'm referring to ideas that are central to what I'm going to call the sex ed industry. This industry began in the United States, and like many ill-conceived notions from America, it's been quite successfully exported to the rest of the world. At the helm of the sex industry here are organizations like Family Planning and Rainbow Youth. From my review of the websites and other material that these groups have created for New Zealand youth, I see that the approach that I'm so familiar with from the states has been duplicated in your country. Now, as a physician, I have one objective, to keep people out of the offices of doctors and therapists. I'm going to demonstrate to you today how the sex ed industry makes my job more difficult. And I know that that's a strong statement to make, but the priority of groups like family planning is not sexual health, it is sexual freedom. The goal of these government-funded organizations is for students to be open to just about any sexual activity. Children are told that sexuality extends from cradle to grave. Early sexual activity with multiple partners is assumed. And high-risk behaviors are normalized and an attitude, uh, an attitude of openness and adventure is celebrated. Now these, of course, are the very behaviors that fuel the epidemics of genital infections, unwanted pregnancies, abortion, and emotional distress, whether or not a condom is used. Young people who practice the lifestyle endorsed by these groups have more doctor's appointments, not less. And that is so for a simple reason. When sexual freedom is the priority, when young people are given the okay to become sexually active and to explore and experiment with multiple partners, they do just that, and their sexual health suffers. You don't need a PhD in public health to understand this. All you need is common sense. Now, these problems are not abstractions to me. I'm reporting to you from the front line. Over the past 25 years, I've seen a steady stream of people come through my office who were suffering from the sexual decisions that they had made. Their suffering was 100% avoidable. To make matters worse, there wasn't much I could do for them because it was after the fact. Now, I'm not speaking about an occasional patient. 
I'm not even speaking about a few dozen patients. I'm saying that I have lost count of the number of patients that I've seen, most of them girls and young women, who have been diagnosed with a sexually transmitted infection or were terrified that they could have HIV, or they were simply confused and upset after hooking up with a guy a few times, developing feelings for that guy, and then realizing that emotional attachment was the last thing that he wanted. And often when I'd explain to these students the science that you're about to hear tonight, she'd say, that makes so much sense. Why didn't I know that? Why didn't anybody tell me that? Well, these were good questions. And I began to wonder, if I'd read years ago in my medical journals about, for example, why girls are so vulnerable to STIs, or about the biochemistry of attachment, which is how we are wired to emotionally connect with someone that we're intimate with, why hadn't this science reached my patients? I mean, they knew all about diet, heart disease, osteoporosis, breast cancer. They knew about a whole range of health issues. So why this ignorance about the consequences of intimate behavior? These questions and others led me to write the book, Unprotected. Each chapter describes a patient of mine and how they were harmed by the sexual ideologies and omission of biological truths in sex education. The students that I wrote about in this book made a lasting impression on me. They turned me into an activist. And it's because of them that I'm here today. After Unprotected, I went deeper into what's taught in sex education, especially the websites and books recommended to adolescents. As a physician and a parent, I couldn't believe what I had seen. And that's why my second book was called You're Teaching My Child What? So for the past seven years, approximately, I've been studying sex education, how it began, and what it is now. I was astonished to realize that sex education is not primarily concerned with preventing disease. Rather, it's a social movement. Its goal is to change society. That was the case 50 years ago when it began, and it's still the case now. Like all social movements, sex education is not based on how the world is. It's based on how the world should be. It's based on a dream, a vision of the perfect world. In this world, there are no substantial differences between male and female. If such differences exist, they are not inborn, they are not eternal, they are due to forces in society against which we are obligated to struggle. In this ideal world, no particular lifestyle is healthier than another. Chlamydia, herpes, HIV, these infect people in a random manner. They are equal opportunity diseases. In this world, an abortion is like a tonsillectomy. This vision appeals to many people because, after all, why should girls pay a higher price for promiscuity than guys? That's sexist. It's not fair. Why should certain sexual encounters be more dangerous than others? That's homophobic. That's also not fair. But this is a made-up world. It doesn't exist. In the real world, the differences between male and female are vast and permanent. One of these differences is that girls have unique biological sensitivities, and early sexual behavior endangers them more than it does boys. That's not sexist. That's something that is seen under a microscope. Furthermore, regarding sexually transmitted infections, certain behaviors and lifestyles are 100% risk-free, and others are treacherous. In the real world, 
And abortion is devastating for some men and some women. It's a wound they carry with them for their entire lives. These are indisputable facts. There's no debating them. But when the facts, including the biological facts, challenge the sex educator's vision of a perfect world, they are omitted from sex ed. If what's seen under the microscope threatens their dream for society, it doesn't exist. That's why I contend that due to this ideology, young people, especially young women, are being sacrificed on the altar of political correctness. We all detest political correctness, but in my profession, in the medical profession, when information is withheld, if the consequences of abortion, for example, are whitewashed, if a particular sexual act is discussed in a casual way without waving any red flags, lives are endangered. So the goal is to change society and create a world without sexual taboos and restrictions. Each individual, regardless of age, makes his or her, her sexual choices. Each person decides how much risk he or she is willing to take. And no judging is allowed. These ideas are at the core of modern sex education, or as it's called sometimes, sexuality education. They are very dangerous ideas. Three groups pay the highest price when biological truths cannot be told and cradle to grave sexual freedom is celebrated. Girls, women, and men who have sex with other men. Please keep in mind that educators describe their material as accurate, ideologically neutral, and in the interest of the student's well-being. They claim to provide your children, your students, with all they need to know to make informed choices. And they insist that they're on the same page as parents. Now, I know that there's lots of variation from one school to the next in what students are taught. But I think it's important for all of you to know that when I reviewed the most popular websites and pamphlets created for young New Zealand people by Family Planning and Rainbow Youth, I found that they are not medically accurate, they are not ideologically neutral, and they do not provide students with all they need to know. I suspect also that what most teens here at home is very differ different from what these groups are telling them. So these authorities promise one thing and do another. Where I come from, that's called a hoax. And I know that's a serious charge to make, but I promise you it's the result of years of research and careful deliberation. So what I'm going to do now is lay out the evidence that supports my argument. Um, I must warn you, like Bob did, that I'm about to present some disturbing information, and I apologize in advance, but you must see it because this is what's being recommended to your students. So I'm going to show you some of the troubling things that young people are taught by groups like Family Planning and Rainbow Youth, as well as AIDS Foundation, and then I'll explain the science that's omitted from their message. First, the claim that's made by these groups <clears throat> that they are on the same page as parents. Almost 70% of New Zealand parents believe that teens should be encouraged, encouraged to delay sex at least until after high school. And in public forums, in material that's written for parents and policymakers, the sex ed industry insists they have the same goal. For example, your Ministry of Education's um, sex ed guide for principals, boards of trustees, and teachers says, a key message within our sexuality education program is the need to delay the start of sexual activity. And in the New Zealand Herald, 
um, that came out a few days ago. Um, there was an article about my visit here, and there was a response from family planning chief executive Jackie Edmund. Edmund. And she said to the New Zealand Herald, we support telling people to have loving, caring relationships and young people to delay having sexual onset. Now that sounds very good. That sounds like what we want to hear. But look at this family planning pamphlet for teens called Your Choice. It says, only you should control your sex life. Make sure it's your choice if or when you sleep with someone. Make sure you're really ready. Only you know when it is right for you. And from another one of their pamphlets that's called Questions and Answers to All Those Interesting Questions About Growing Up. There is no right age to have sex. The age someone chooses to have sex is different for everyone. It needs to be when it feels right for that individual person. Um, another, a website called theword.org that family planning links to. Before you have sex for the first time, there are definitely a few things that need to be discussed. Are we ready? How comfortable do we both feel about becoming intimate with each other? Contraception, what options work best for you? Remember, it's best to use condoms, lube, and contraception until you are in a long-term committed relationship. Now, I've underlined that because it implies that you may not be in a long-term committed relationship. So kids are told it's up to you. There is no right age. Make sure you talk about contraception and make sure you feel ready. Now, some teens may ask, how do I know when I feel ready? So here's some more guidance from family planning. I think you're ready, this is a quote from another teen, I think you're ready to have sex if you feel it's right. If you like hear little voices, you know, don't do it, don't do it, you should hold off. But you know, if it's like, yeah, I'm ready, then okay. Now mind you, according to this advice, you could have a 13-year-old girl who meets a 16-year-old boy, and after a few days, if she hears little voices saying, I'm ready, I'm ready, do it, do it, so long as a condom, according to family planning, it's just fine. So this is certainly not encouraging kids to delay sexual activity. Quite the opposite. And, you know, I challenged um, Jackie Edmund to a debate, or really anyone from any of these organizations. Um, we had the opportunity for a, a radio debate um, but no one has stepped up yet to do that, unfortunately. Now let's look at the claim made by sex educators that parents should be the primary educators of their children. This is from another pamphlet for parents. Parents and caregivers are the first and most important sexuality educators of their children. Sex education ought to be taught at home. Now this implies that what the sex educators do is basically build on the parents' message, right? It implies that educators and parents are on the same page. But I'd argue that that's not at all the case. For example, um, look at this site to which family planning refers students. In fact, sex ed organizations introduce students to high-risk behaviors, discussing them as acceptable healthy options. But these are activities that most parents don't want their children to even hear about. This is from the website Curious. Um, I'm going to let you read this for yourself.
There are many other examples from this and um, other websites <clears throat> that uh, family planning links to. So suffice it to say that this all comes from a certain worldview, a vision of sexuality in which the focus, like I said, is not on health, but on being open and accepting and free of judgment. Of course, what's missing here is the biology that certain forms of sexual expression are much higher risk than others, with or without condoms. And the notion that all lifestyles are equal in terms of health is a dangerous one. Another one of those dangerous ideas that I referred to later, I mean earlier. So the priority is sexual license, not health. And when sexual license or sexual freedom reigns, sexual health is going to suffer. The claim next of being medically accurate and science-based, I'm going to begin with the fact that girls are biologically more vulnerable to infection than boys, and they're not being informed of that. For example, regarding the human papillomavirus, um, the HPV virus, and that's a picture of it, it's actually a, a lot smaller than that. Um, why does the human papillomavirus infect girls so easily? In the States, we have 25% of all teen girls are infected with either this, mostly this virus and also the herpes virus. One in four teens. Why is it so easy for this virus to infect girls? It's because of their immature cervix. The cervix is the entrance to the uterus. And <clears throat> uh, what you're looking at here on the left side is a photo of the cervix itself. Um, the center, the central area is called the transformation zone, and it is um, circled with a uh, yellow marking, and on the right side of the slide, you see a diagram. The diagram indicates that um, the area that's in the center of the cervix there is only covered by one layer of cells. That the the um, right part of that diagram shows one layer of cells, and these this solitary layer is very easy for uh, viruses and bacteria to penetrate. As a girl gets older and she moves into her later teens and her early 20s, the, this, this vulnerable area becomes thicker and tougher as shown in, on the other side of that diagram. But um, what you see there on one side is, is many level, many layers of cells and that's what the mature cervix is covered with. And that is clearly, understandably, more difficult, if not impossible, for viruses and bacteria to penetrate. So as a girl gets older, with each year that passes, she's building her own biological um, protection, you could call it, like a shield. So it's harder for her to be infected. There are, um, well, let me show you this. So this is a photograph of what the mature cervix looks like. It's smooth and pink, and those are the, if you look at it microscopically, it's many, many layers of cells. And then here is the immature cervix, and that central orange area is the zone that's only covered by one cell and is so easily infected. And we have found the research has shown that there are two environmental factors that can delay the maturing of the cervix. Remember, what you want is for it to mature. One factor is smoking. When girls smoke cigarettes, their cervix matures more slowly. The other factor is when they're on birth control pills. The hormone in the pill can prevent the, um, this area from shrinking. Um, so when we put young girls on birth control pills, um, we may actually be inadvertently increasing her vulnerability to infection. 
So I like to call uh, these cells that cover the cervix the one layer of cells, politically incorrect cells, because boys don't have them in their reproductive system. And, um, um, you know, this just means that Boys and girls are certainly different. Um, this is one of many ways that they are. So you see, biology, not only morality says, and traditional values, and family first says, wait. It's also biology that says it's best to wait. Biology also says girls are more vulnerable than boys, and they need to know that. Now, another interesting thing, uh, I can't spend too much time on it because I have to get to so many other things, but another reason why it's easy to infect a young woman is that there are times in her cycle when her immune system is, is, is weaker. Um, in the middle of her cycle at ovulation is when um, she's, she's more vulnerable to infection because her body won't fight it off as easily. So... And this is well known. Um, this is, you know, this has been known actually for decades that sexually transmitted diseases pose a severe threat to women's health and fertility. Biological factors place women at greater risk than men. And this is unlikely to change even if your counsel for civil, civil liberties threatens a lawsuit. Didn't anyone think that was funny? <laughs> But the science about girls' vulnerability is omitted from sex education. And all the while they claim to be feminists, advancing the welfare of young women. It's totally upside down. The immature cervix should be at the front and center for anyone teaching science-based sex education. Real feminism protects girls and women. A few more thing, things about uh, the human papillomavirus is that the emotional consequences are often whitewashed. And I have a, whoops, a study here from New Zealand showing that 75% of patients experience depression and anger at their initial diagnosis of human papillomavirus. And for one third of these, the feelings persisted for years. Now, I'll, I'll just remind you that this virus can cause both genital warts and um, uh, in, in rare cases, cervical cancer and other cancers. Um, but, but overall, sex education in my country, in your country, um, whitewashes what it's like for people when they find out that they have this virus which, for which there, there is no cure. Um, there are treatments available, but the warts um, often return. Now... <clears throat> I don't want to get too graphic, and I know that you um, just had dinner, or you're about, or tea, tea. You just had tea, or you're about to have tea. So I won't get graphic, but to enter a relationship knowing that at any time you could have an outbreak of warts or blisters on your genitals, it's hard to feel beautiful. It's hard to feel attractive when you're diseased. Um, so this is, this is important stuff. Now, another big thing that is missing from sex education is that the human papilloma virus um, can be transmitted through oral sex into the mouth, and then it stays dormant in the, in the mouth and the throat, and years later it can cause uh, throat cancer. I also just learned this last week that certain strains, strains of the human papillomavirus are associated with increased heart disease. They think that the virus inactivates a gene that regulates heart disease. So anyway, there's so many things that we don't know about this. We shouldn't just say, like this fellow that interviewed me at the um, Herald, the New Zealand, is that what it's called? The New Zealand Herald. So, we were talking about human papillomavirus, and he said, oh, well, everyone gets that. Um, everyone's going to get that. And I just said, what? What are you talking? He said, you know, 
he, didn't, he didn't, really didn't want to hear about it, but the truth is that not everyone has this virus, and many people manage to escape it, and that is the ideal that we should be presenting to our students, not that everyone gets this. So um, I was saying that boys, getting back to the, the cervix and the, the one cell layer, that boys don't have this area of vulnerability in their reproductive system, but they do have it in their GI system, their gastrointestinal system. And this is one of many reasons why anal intercourse is so very dangerous. And this is one of those difficult subjects. Um, you need to know, though, that, that kids are being taught that there are three types of sexual intercourse, vaginal, oral, and anal. And um, they do not, however, learn that even with a condom, anal intercourse is a high-risk activity. And this, again, is based not on morality, but on biology. And <clears throat> um, the vagina has these different properties. Um, it has a low pH, which inactivates the HIV um, particle. The mucus has certain proteins that fight HIV. The lining is thick. It, um, there's stretching because the vagina obviously is a birth can canal and it's made to deliver a big 10-pound baby. So the vagina is constructed in a completely different way from the rectum, which um, is, is made differently. And also the rectum, I discovered in my research, has a kind of cell called an M cell. And those cells, I write about it in my book, they actually take the, um, they take HIV and deliver it right into the lymphatic system, which is where it wants to get to, to infect the person. So M cells are very dangerous and you don't have them in the vagina. So these are some of the reasons why for the transmission of HIV, anal intercourse is at least 20 to 30 times more dangerous than vaginal intercourse. Now, I like to give students and my patients the same advice that a friend of mine, um, whose name is John Potterat, gave to his kids. John, for 30 years, was the director of all the STD and AIDS programs in a city called Colorado Springs. And he's authored about 200 publications about STDs, so he's really an expert. Before his kids became sexually active, he told them, the anus is an exit, not an entrance. This is not the Bible, he told them. This is science. Nature put a tight sphincter, a muscle that stays closed, at the entrance of the anus for a reason. Keep out. Few of us are experts like my friend John, but all kids need to hear his wisdom. However, they won't be hearing it from the people over at Family Planning or Rainbow Youth or even from your Ministry of Health. Um, earlier today, Bob showed me some pamphlets that I guess came from one of the schools, um, and they were written by the Ministry of Health, and um, they did not provide this warning to students. Um, the real question here is, why promote the idea that vaginal and anal intercourse are comparable? What is behind this notion of generic intercourse? What's behind it is the false belief that males and females are the same and that their unions are equivalent. That's what they want your children to believe. The last thing that I want to tell, well, the next to last, that is omitted from sex ed is called the biochemistry of attachment. And this is very exciting science about human attachment through sexuality. Um, I'm going to quickly tell you a story about a patient of mine who, who I call Kayla. And she was having one-night stands or hookups. Um, I worked many years in a student counseling center at, at a big university. So um, she was 18, and she came to my office because she'd been unable to get to class for two weeks. She was drinking and smoking pot most of the night and sleeping during the day. Kayla was vague about how she'd fallen into this pattern, but soon the discussion turned to David, a guy who lived down the hall, 
He was very nice and cute, and they hung out with the same group of friends. One night, they started kissing. One thing led to another, and they had sex. After this happened a few times, Kayla discovered that she had feelings for him. I can't stop thinking about him, she said to me. What's wrong with me? Kayla found that the more time she spent with David, the more time she needed. She wanted a relationship with him. But he told her, no way. Now, Kayla knew that guys don't like high-maintenance girls. So she'd hook up with him and act like it didn't matter. That's what everyone else is able to do, she thought. Why can't I? But in fact, Kayla was always hoping to hear from David, constantly waiting for a text message and checking her email. She longed for some sign of connection, some indication that she meant something to him. People close to her noticed that she was getting irritable and moody, and because she couldn't concentrate on her work or sleep well, she began to drink and smoke pot to help her relax. David was always around because he lived right down the hall, and he was interested in hooking up with her, but not much else. Things spiraled downwards to a point where Kayla really was not herself. She was failing three subjects. She was abusing substances every night. And when she was high, she would hook up with other guys. I told Kayla that I'd get her help so she could stop smoking and drinking, and she was fine with that. Then I advised her to stop all hooking up. No kissing, no sex, nothing. At least not for now, I told her, because she's too fragile emotionally. Well, she just couldn't believe that. No kissing, she asked me. I can't kiss any guys. Kissing is an intimate behavior, I told her. It has an effect on you. How about trying it for one week? Can you agree to that? Okay, she said, but this is going to mean a big change of lifestyle. I'm going to need something to remind me. So there was a rubber band on my desk, one of those wide rubber bands. So I gave it to her, and I told her to write on the rubber band, no hooking up. I told her to put it on her wrist and keep it there until our next appointment so it would remind her of our conversation. Well, telling a patient to wear a rubber band with advice on it is not something that I learned in medical school, nor was it any more than a stopgap solution to this crisis. But I considered her behavior an emergency because whether or not she used a condom, I knew that she could show up at her next appointment pregnant or infected with a sexually transmitted infection. So I did whatever I could to help her stop these meaningless encounters. She took the rubber band, she wrote no hooking up on it, and she wore it. Now what's wrong with this picture? Kayla was a bright girl. In fact, she was an honors student in high school. She knew very well what was and was not responsible sexual activity. In fact, Kayla and David had followed the guidelines for responsible sexual behavior, that sex be consensual, non-exploitative, honest, pleasurable, and protected. This was a list that I got from a, um, a website in the States where students are, it's like a family planning type of website for students. Kayla and David's encounters met these criteria. They followed the rules. So what went wrong? What went wrong is that like so many girls, Kayla was naive and misinformed. She was completely unaware that as a woman, she has vulnerabilities related to sexual behavior that David doesn't. What went wrong is that she didn't realize sex is a serious matter. A single encounter, even with protection, can change your life forever. That's not sexist, that's biology. When Kayla is with David, her brain is flooded with the hormone oxytocin. 
This is a politically incorrect molecule. It challenges the belief that the differences between men and women are due to socialization. It also challenges the idea that sexual behavior can be easily separated from emotional attachment. A hormone is a molecule that travels from one organ to another with a message. Depending on the context, oxytocin carries different messages. During labor, it travels from the brain to the uterus with the message, contract and push out the baby. During nursing, it travels from the brain to the breast saying, make milk available. It also travels within the brain with messages about emotions and behaviors. If you take a virgin rat and you inject her with oxytocin and then put her in a cage with another rat's litter, she will act toward that litter as if those babies are her own. So oxytocin carries a message. Create a bond. Create an emotional attachment. And what's important for young people to know is that this hormone is released during intimate behavior as well. Intercourse is not necessary, and need I say that condoms have no effect on the actions of this hormone. Am I proposing that a casual sexual encounter causes a deep emotional bond, such as what you see between a mother and child? Of course not. That's ridiculous. But I'm suggesting that girls must learn from their biology and understand that they are wired not only to experience pleasure from moments of closeness and intimacy, she is also wired to have an emotional reaction. And I don't want to mislead you. Men also have hormones that promote attachment, and of course, they develop deep bonds to their partners. But remember, men, especially young men, have a lot of testosterone. And testosterone drives them to want to distribute their DNA as far and as wide as possible. Another difference between male and female is that estrogen, the female hormone, ramps up the effect of oxytocin and testosterone dampens it. And very interesting how when is estrogen highest in a female? It's right before she ovulates. So the way that we are, if you want to say, if you believe in a creator, you can say the way we're created, or if you believe in evolution, you can say the way we've evolved, but whatever you want to say, at the time in a woman's cycle, when she, um, it, when, when she can, has the potential of creating a new life in her, is when she is most primed to connect to the person that she's with. Now, in addition to promoting feelings of attachment, oxytocin also... Um, affects our judgment and our risk-taking. It, um, it dampens the area of the brain that waves red flags when you're about to do something um, dangerous. So instead of being very cautious about things, um, it, you know, instead of a red light, you're going to have a yellow light or a green light. It affects that area of the brain called the amygdala that's supposed to um, uh, alert you to something that you're about to do that may not be smart. Oxytocin affects that area as well. So basically, when Kayla is getting it on, as they say, with David, the oxytocin that's being released affects how she thinks and feels. And this is also very interesting. Only I'll just take a second. Oxytocin is being used in people with um, high-functioning autism or Asperger's disorder because autism, as you know, is a disorder of connection. Um, these individuals um, have, have a lack of attachment to other people. They feel anxious with people. They don't read social cues well. They don't read facial cues well. They avoid um, looking into people's eyes. And it's been found that when you give them some oxytocin, they improve in those areas. Um, so oxytocin switches love and trust on, and it switches caution and aversion off. So 
When Kayla asked me what's wrong with her for feeling attached to David and yearning for some sign that he was attached to her, I told her, there's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you. She was relieved to discover she wasn't crazy. The only thing wrong with this young woman was her ignorance of her unique female wiring. About that, she didn't have a clue. But how could she? The sexuality experts who promised to provide her with medically accurate, up-to-date information failed to do so. I'm going to quickly go through um, the issues with condoms. These are quotes from family planning um, brochures uh, about condoms. These are great at helping to protect you from STIs. Used correctly, they are 98% effective. If used correctly every time, they are 90% effective. Um, get them from your clinic. You can get heaps for $3. Now, this is a problem um, because the real numbers are, in terms of pregnancy, perfect use by adults. Perfect use. That means every time and can, not using it every time perfectly, there's a 98, um, the, the, protect, the avoidance of pregnancy is 98%. But by typical use by adults, which means not every time, the, it slips to 85%. This is only vis-a-vis -vis conception, uh, uh, avoiding pregnancy. So if we look at what the numbers probably are for for teenagers whose typical use is going to be worse, we can assume, than adults, when you think of alcohol use and impulsivity and so on. So it's going to be under 85%. But the question was asked in 2001. There was a meeting of experts outside of Washington, D.C. What is the scientific evidence on the effectiveness of latex male condom used to prevent STD transmission during vaginal intercourse. And they met for a week and talked and compared and went through the research, and this was their answer. That meant that it depends on the organism. There are many different organisms that we're looking at. The best, the best numbers are for HIV, and that number is 80%. The worst numbers are for the human papillomavirus, which is probably around 0%. So even when condoms are used 100% of the time, a lot of people are still going to get herpes and um, human papillomavirus because these viruses live on skin that is not covered by condoms. And even if you don't have a blister or a wart, the virus can be present on the skin and you and a person can share them with somebody else. So what bothers me and what should bother all of you is that um, these terms are being used like very good protection, very effective protection, excellent protection, even moderate protection. In this study of um, herpes, 100% condom use only lowered the risk by 30%. Now herpes, is, is not, this is not fun to have herpes. This is devastating. And to only have a 30% lower risk, I would not call that moderate protection. Now, I want to just mention that these studies all referred to vaginal intercourse, not anal intercourse. And the Food and Drug Administration in the United States, which is responsible for, um, for approving medical devices, and condoms are considered a medical device, if you go to their website, they will say condoms may be more likely to break during anal intercourse, anal intercourse. even if the condom doesn't break, anal intercourse is very risky. Um, they, condoms provide some protection, but it's simply too dangerous to practice. And this was said by one of our surgeon generals years ago. It's still on the website there. And I believe that this is what we should be telling young people. It's simply too dangerous to practice. A word about the teen brain. There's just so much science here that I could tell you. I'm just picking a few, few vital things. 
all of us who have worked with young people, with teens, know that, how should I say it, they do goofy things. Use that word goofy, right? They do goofy things. And then the next day, when you say to them, what were you thinking? Well, what do they say? They, they often say, you know, I guess I wasn't thinking. And we've discovered now, this is so amazing, we've discovered that the part of their brain, that the part of, of, of anyone's brain that is responsible for, um, for thinking things out, for analyzing, for thinking of consequences, you know, what's going to be in the future if I do such and such, that is the part of the brain that matures last. And it actually doesn't mature until the mid-20s. And what I have here is um, an advertisement that was run by a, a, a company that sells car insurance. It's called Allstate. And they drew on this research um, about the teen brain to explain to people why, their ins why the insurance rates um, are so high for teenagers and young adults. But then when you reach 25, the rates go down. So this was their ad. Why do most 16-year-olds drive like they're missing a part of their brain? Because they are. And there you have, it says their teen, 16-year-old brain, and it shows a part of it missing. But this is not a joke. This has really been shown. Now, what, what is the relevance of this to sex education? It's very relevant to sex education because one of the core ideas of sex education is that all we need to do is give young people information and birth control and reproductive health services. Just give them information, 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 truckloads of condoms. Just keep giving it to them. But we know now that very often the reason for their poor decisions is not that they don't have the information. It's that they don't have the good judgment. And think about it. With condoms, you know, we're asking teenagers in the heat of the moment, you know, we're asking them to suddenly stop and you know, find the condom, make sure it hasn't expired, open it up, put it on properly. I mean, come on, that's called realistic. I think that it's much more realistic to advise students that it's best not to even find yourself in that situation. So I'm going to wrap up just by telling you that in a recent interview, I was told that I must be exaggerating. Um, I was told it must be hyperbole when I say that sex education is madness. I do call it madness. That it teaches untruths and exposes our kids to smut. If that's true, I was asked, wouldn't there be congressional hearings about it? But I am not exaggerating. From my perspective, having taken that oath to prevent disease, the principles of, of what, for me, it, over in the States is Planned Parenthood and your Family Planning Association or Rainbow Youth, those, those principles, they are madness because they promote sexual freedom. And when sexual freedom reigns, sexual health suffers. Is every young person going to postpone sex? Of course not. But we are still obligated to inform them of the risks they face, to teach them biological truths about their physical and emotional vulnerabilities, to warn them in a no-nonsense manner about avoiding high-risk behaviors, and to encourage the highest standard. That's what we do in every other area of health care. But when it comes to sexuality, kids are being taught that they can play with fire. And the waiting rooms of doctors and therapists are filled with people who have been burned inside and out. I urge all of you to condemn this dangerous message, to tell students that sex is a serious matter, that what they're seeing on television and at the movies is fiction. 
In fact, science affirms the age-old wisdom of restricting sexual expression to marriage. That is the ideal. Tell students that the pain and anguish of sexually transmitted infections and unwanted pregnancies are 100% avoidable. It's all in their hands, and they can do it. Educate yourselves about these government-funded groups and the material they promote to students. Don't allow this stuff into your schools. There's a lot of work to be done, and it's not easy to speak of these things. It's awkward, and everyone squirms. But the stakes are very high, and it's too important not to. But most of all, we really don't want to hear what I've been hearing from my students. We don't want our students to come back to us in a few years and say, why didn't I know? Why didn't anybody tell me? Thank you so much.